This program is brought to you by Emory University. On September 27, 2013, the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence at Emory University hosted a discussion titled, Graduate Students and Public Scholarship. The panelists explored the opportunities, potential risks, and ethical dimensions for graduate students who take their work into the public realm, as well as strategies for pursuing public scholarship. The speakers were David Lynn, Asa Griggs Candler Professor in Chemistry and Biology, Peggy Barlett, Goodrich C. White Professor of Anthropology, and Whitney Peoples, Doctoral Candidate in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. In this video, Professor Barlett discusses the power and importance of merging personal and professional values to disseminate important ideas. I think the, the one uh, weakness of the social sciences today and when I was a graduate student is that there is a tendency to see applied work as inferior or engagement in some way with social change as a less scholarly activity. And yet that's one of the places where we figure out whether our theories have any validity or usefulness at all. And so in some ways, I think the people who have thrown their ideas up against the, uh, the hard realities of trying to actually do something uh, are able to come out with refined theories um, in ways that are very important. And we can see this in a, uh, a bunch of different realms. And I guess uh, when I think about the importance of, of staying uh, true to certain kinds of intellectual norms of abstraction from action or abstraction from politics, I worry um, that we run the risk of having theories that are irrelevant. And I think there's some fields where that conclusion has been reached. Um, the economists uh, came together a few years ago after the crisis and said, how did we go so terribly wrong? And one of the ways they went so terribly wrong is they had some decades of doing theoretical work without caring whether it really conformed to reality on the ground. Um, and so developing models became the only measure of success rather than really being able to accurately predict what happened in the real world. So I think that also contributes, um, shifting here to my experience as a young faculty member, if we don't have some concrete ways in which we can demonstrate, not just for our professors, but for the public at large, that the academy is making a contribution, we run a very real risk of losing the support for the academy. And what we've seen, I think, over the last 15 years or so is a declining public confidence that higher education is a valuable investment, deserves the money that it has been receiving, and we are seeing declining public commitments to the great universities around the country. And so it's really dangerous for us, I think, not to, um, if we're talking about, if speaking as someone who really values uh, both the research and the, the quality of education in a place like Emory. So in addition to the danger of the irrelevance of the academy, there's a certain danger, I think, that uh, if we don't bring ourselves into our work, that the work itself can be sterile. I remember uh, in the early days of the Piedmont Project, when talking about environmental issues on campus was really quite new. There was a faculty member whose own research didn't really have anything much to do with sustainability, came together though and was thinking about that with other faculty members as we were working to build stronger curriculum around these issues. And he said afterwards, wow, I hadn't really thought about the possibility that my personal life and my personal values and my professional life could come together. It was a whole new concept for him, and he had somehow been able to keep those two parts of his life completely separate. And I um, just realized I could put this on mute. Uh, a second part, uh, I guess a contrast to that, would be uh, the example of a faculty member, Wendy Anderson, at Drury University. Um, who was an ecologist and came to Drury to teach ecology uh, in, in the 
very focused scientific way that was not engaged with any kinds of other broader social issues. She really wanted to do islands and geographies of change on those islands. And uh, when she got on campus, people would call her up and talk with her about recycling. <laughs> she said, I do recycling. They do island geography, island biochemical stuff. And uh, I'm really annoyed that you're trying to make me I'm not, I'm, and she was not, it did not consider herself an environmentalist or never joined the Sierra Club. She, that's not my thing, I'm a scientist. But then, as, as she recounts, uh, you know, very appreciate your mentioning the forthcoming book, which has now come forth. <laughs> and uh, she mentions in this book that uh, a series of personal events that happened, uh, seeing Al Gore's movie, an Inconvenient Truth, and <clears throat> giving birth to her first child, and she suddenly realized that these were pressing issues that she could contribute to, and that she didn't really have the luxury of saying, I don't do that. Particularly in the context where nobody else on her campus was stepping forward to address them. And so she shifted to becoming uh, somebody on her campus who really wanted to see change. And I won't spoil the whole story for you of, of some of the very interesting things that happened there, but she was lucky to be in a place that had really uh, open administration that supported what she was doing and provided resources. They ended up with an Office of Sustainability. Some dramatic changes happened on campus. Uh, it was an area in which there were some small industries and some agricultural centers, but there was not a coherent vision for the future. And together with the public schools, Drury as a private school began to work in with high schools and they developed a consortium of educational institutions that began to look at what is the long-term future if we think 100 years, 50 years forward, how can we really see sustainability in this place that includes the normal three parts of sustainability, a thriving economy, a healthy ecosystem, and greater social justice and participation of all folks. So that there really was a, a sense of creativity in that. And, uh, and I really like uh, the comment that one of the other chapter authors makes in which she talks about the difference between the spider and the starfish. And the uh, spider, uh, as somebody says, what you get is what you get, a body, a head, a leg, um, maybe it could, survive without a leg or two, but it can't survive without its head. Starfish have an incredible quality that if you cut off an arm, they'll grow a new arm. And, and there is this moment, if one of the arms wants to move, it must convince the other arms that it's a good idea to do so. And that arm starts moving, and then in a the process that no one fully understands, the other arms cooperate and move as well. And the argument is that uh, the organizations that are facing some of these critical societal issues today are more like starfish than they are like spiders. And that um, it's not so much that we are top-down driven uh, by the head of the body of the spider, but are in much more amorphous ways trying to figure out how we respond to critical issues. How are we on this campus moving to the next level, whether it's curriculum or whether it's a sustainability-focused culture, whether it's lifetime commitments? And I guess here, um, I, I would like to just say a word about the op-ed project, because one of the opportunities that we have as academics is to take these creative ideas and put them out not only to undergraduates and to other graduate students but to the general public and to begin to support uh, a more informed dialogue around issues that are important to us. It's a place to take our creativity. One of the things that I learned uh, through this uh, year's fellowship is that it, there is a culture of journalism that for us in the academy it must be learned. And uh, I was quite daunted at one point when we were having a, a webinar with a major public radio uh, figure who was interviewing, regularly interviews people. And it's the kind of person that many of us in this room would love to be interviewed by to get our ideas out there. And she said, well, of course, if you really want to be on my show, you ought to listen to my show for the last two months to get an idea of 
how this goes and how people respond, what kinds of questions I ask. I, I was really taken aback by that because I don't have time to sit around and listen to two months of this person's shows, right? You know, I have a day job. <laughs> and uh, the rest of you as well are maxed out with mostly with what we're doing. So I guess it was um, humbling to me to recognize that public scholarship is not something that um, we can do easily or lightly, that it does involve learning new skills. And that's where, again, I like order. And, uh, and I like the commitment to engagement on campus because when I was a graduate student, there was an expectation that these naughty, difficult societal problems would be solved by experts and that we might be those experts and the knowledge would flow top down, kind of like a spider. We'll figure it out and we'll tell them. And then as we went through the development decades and things that the experts were recommending weren't working, and as we went through uh, challenges with um, various kinds of solutions, we began to realize that it has to be a much more participatory process. Um, and in anthropology, we were contributing in the development arena to how do you involve the consumers of the new knowledge in the production of that knowledge. And I think that's the same thing that we see as we try, as I said at the beginning, we try applying the theory and seeing how it works and feeding that back into our own knowledge production. The last thing I think that I would uh, share is that I think in the op-ed project, even though I have been involved with sustainability on campus now for more than a decade and had been challenged to shift my style of writing, my style of speaking, my way of engaging groups both on campus and off campus for a while, I still found the opportunity to think about the dialogue that occurs in an op-ed was a real stretch. There is something about this that is demanding change on the personal level and demanding a kind of growth. That's exactly what Wendy Anderson reports at Drury, that she didn't feel comfortable with some of the new roles she had to engage in. She didn't have really all the skills she needed to deal with the facilities management folks that she had to now cooperate with. And she calls herself sometimes a mouthy professor. Uh, but she nevertheless persisted in learning that and came to be really a good team player with some of these people. So there is a, an amazing story that she tells as they, as a team, go to the Board of Trustees and ask for a school of the environment and ask for a, a loan fund, a revolving loan fund that will allow them to do some very neat things and to listen to how, like a starfish, that Board of Trustees comes along and says yes. This is not only a good thing to do, we should have been doing this for a long time now, and there's nothing else better we can do with this money but make this go forward. That sense of vitality. And, and I happen to know that, that she then, after that year, went back to the island and did some more ecology. So it isn't as though she left it behind. And in my own case, even though I did leave behind uh, traditional anthropological fieldwork, Books have still emerged, and uh, just as she got tenure, rewards continue to come. And so I guess I feel like if you don't put the personal together with your professional, you run the risk of burning out, of being inauthentic, and of not being able to grow in the maximum ways you have to grow to be as compelling, both to the students and to the general public. We don't have to get it perfect, but we have to do our best. And I think without that engaged learning, without the ethical connection, we're not going to be able to address these critical societal problems. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.